Yeah. Good. Good. Welcome to the Meet Josh Greeley panel. I am Josh Greeley. You have met me. Panel over. Thank you. Enjoy the con. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, as I will attempt to talk about myself for an hour, I guess. It's weird. We'll, we'll make it a communal thing. I'm going to stay up here because I don't want to sit down. Uh, I guess uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, uh, stuff that I've done. Uh, I'm a voice actor for Funimation Entertainment, uh, as well as Ogatron 5000, Seraphim, Digital, uh, you old uh, ADV Films, Sound Cadence, Cup of Tea Entertainment, a whole bunch of really cool places. Uh, some roles you might know me from, uh, one of the bigger ones, uh, Armin Arlert in Attack on Titan, and also the narrator. Uh, Akusa Shishido from Corpse Princess, uh, Akihise Yoshi from Baka and Test, uh, Kurenosuke from Princess Jellyfish. He starts off as just a cool bro. And then he becomes fabulous, darling! He's just great! Uh, strut that stuff, baby! And, uh, let's see, uh... Yeah, Aki Isayoshi mentioned that. Hideyoshi's my wife. Uh, Hideyoshi is best girl. End of story. Uh, ooh, Yuki from Future Diary. Don't kill me! Uh, let's see. Recent stuff. Uh, a lot of stuff that I can't talk about that will be announced on Monday. <laughs> NDA suck. Uh, do I? Yeah, Gino's up from Psychopaths. Keep your Psychopaths clear. Uh... Kenichi the Mightiest Disciple was one of my bigger ones. Uh, one of my first ones, actually, with Funimation. My absolute first one with Funimation. Uh, so, uh, Luger Will Presnick in Tales of Zillia 2. Hello, welcome, come on in. Oh my god, Tokyo Ghoul, that's amazing, dude. That's freaking cool. Um, actually, uh, I played Naki in Tokyo Ghoul, and I was one of the writers for the show as well, for the dub. Uh, speaking of writing, I would say that again. Thank you very much. Yuji Sakai from Shakugan no Shana was also one of the writers on that show. Speaking of writing, uh, I also uh, was part of the writing team for Fairy Tale for about three years. Uh, I played a couple of characters in, in Fairy Tales, where including uh, Black Snake and uh, Hughes. Thank you. See, that's why I bring her. <laughs> uh, um, what's another one? Uh, I also was one of the writers for, uh, I helped write some of Free. I also play the voice of Nitori in Free. Just keep swimming! Rain, put on the freaking shark suit! Uh, and, uh, I was also one of the writers for Overlord, which I specifically requested that show because I'm a huge freaking MMO nerd. And I love MMOs. Uh, and just gaming in general, really. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff, and I could just continue going on, but you don't want to hear a freaking list. Uh, other than that, really, uh, I've been acting since I was about five years old. I got started in theater really early on, mostly because my mom was tired of me cutting up her fine linen to make different costumes, for, and so she put me to theater so I could ruin other people's linen. And uh, fell in love with it, just kept on doing it, and... Uh, Later in life, I, uh, I, as much as I loved theater, I, I, I felt really constrained by it as well in terms of performance because, it, you know, while theater can be fun, as an actor, you want to be able to portray as many people as you can and, like, really get to explore different archetypes and different psyches. And with theater and on camera and stuff like that, you're limited to your body type. And I grew up a very big kid, and uh, so I was kind of pretty much pigeonholed into only playing supporting roles or uh, the big comic relief characters and, and, and stuff like that. But with voice work, your voice can be anything. I, I could be a 300-pound supervillain or uh, I could be a cross-dressing <laughs> I could be a cross-dressing little boy. I can, I can be an alien from outer space. I could be a talking pickle if I wanted to be. Like, it's, like, there's really, the sky's the limit when it comes to animation. And uh, I started to really fall in love with uh, voice work when I was uh, when I was a kid, and around that time, about 12 years old, uh, I discovered this little show called Sailor Moon, and uh, fell in love with it, and wanted to really start to learn more about what this anime stuff was. And then uh, finally, my my little home country hometown in the middle of nowhere, Texas, got cable, and with it came Toonami, and oh, old Toonami man would rush home, be able to watch Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball and the old Tenchi Muyo and Gundam Wing. And that's kind of where my addiction started. And then luckily, a few years later, 
and uh, after buying a whole lot of VHS tapes and, and DVDs, I, I got lucky enough to, to get to audition for what was then ADV Films, and they're now long gone, unfortunately. But I uh, got to work with them and some amazing people, and ultimately, eventually some of those people left and started working for Funimation, and I got to go with them. And here I am now, 12 years later, 12 years of doing anime voice work, and I'm like, this was just this crazy little thing I thought I'd try. And now I've kind of accomplished everything, and I don't know what to do with it now. I'm just going to keep riding that train. Uh, so yeah, so this is that's just kind of a quick kind of rundown about me and my career. If uh, do we have any questions to start off with, any it doesn't have to be necessarily about me or roles I've played. It could be about anime in general. It could be about the industry, uh, recording processes, writing processes for dubs. Uh, sky's the limit, really. Sure, right there. And uh, Hawkman has uh, regarding the avatars. Yeah. Um, so to get the, their really high pitched voices, did you all have to like naturally speak like that, or did they use audio equipment to uh, uh, to give that effect? Okay. Uh, for the the min for the little avatars in Baca and Test, some people had to be pitched up. Uh, I did not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so basically everything that I was doing with the, with the Avatar was way... Because Akihisa's voice is, is already kind of like in this area. It's more of a head voice. And uh, so really all I had to do was kind of pinch that off a little bit more and... All of a sudden I got this little thing here! And, and uh, the... Uh, so I would do stuff like... And little crazy noises for him and... Gremlin sounds and that's just kind of uh, what ended up being the Avatar. But uh, there were some instances where they did have to pitch some people up, and uh, they did have to pitch me up for one of the sequences uh, because uh, when we were doing the OVAs, and they uh, they have that huge battle uh, with the avatars, the two on two fights in the big arena. I had blown my voice out, and so I couldn't get that high anymore for that session. And so for for that, they did pitch it up a little bit. Uh, but yeah, pretty, that's pretty much it. And uh, you had a question a second ago. Yes, Josh. Okay, so yeah, I also like to like, like ask, like, like the Tifton was also here. But, um, like, I asked through this, um, like, um, I've been watching Puzzles and Dragons. Yay! Like, so far, I'm digging it. How about you? I love, I really, really like Puzzles. Who here has seen or heard of Puzzles and, and Dragons? I know there's a, there's a cell phone game for it, but they, they've uh, released a, an anime for it now as well. It's hitting, it's hitting all of the Pokemon bones, you know, in me, like, all, all the, all the stuff that I got to, to the, I grew up watching, like, Pokemon and Digimon, uh, it's really cool to be able to have a, a fun, fan, family-friendly show like that for a change, uh, Ace is, is, he kind of reminds me, it's like, he's like Ash Ketchum and Young Goku did the fusion dance, so like, his hair is just totally out of this, that crazy, like, Goku hair, but he's got a star, he's got a star right there on his head. And uh, Alexis, who plays essentially my Pikachu, <laughs> like the little Tama, the little egg dragon creature, is just so. It's it's every time that she's recorded before me, we get to go in and I and I get to hear her and all the silly stuff that she's done, and she'll leave me little bombs like Tama saying some obscene things to me, and like uh, it's 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 been a blast. And uh, I really like the fact that they. That they've uh, that hasn't really felt like any filler. Like from moment one, when the adventure it's when the adventure starts, it just keeps on moving. It hasn't lost momentum yet, and I'm I'm really excited to see where it goes. I'm really I think that the bald dude is going to end up being the main villain for the show, and we'll see. And that's it's funny because my friend Ian Sinclair, who plays him, he uh, was the voice of Space Dandy and uh, Romano and Italia and uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. He also directed Black Butler. And we used to be roommates, so if he ends up being like the villain for the show, and I have to fight him, that's just going to be a blast. The question, yes, ma'am. Um, you said you you played, you voiced Armin, right? Yes, ma'am. Join the scouts. We have cookies. Yeah. <laughs> do you do the scream of freedom, or the scream where he, when he saw Aaron literally get shot? I cannot do the scream, unfortunately. I'm so sorry. Uh, I actually blew my voice out earlier this week recording one of the new broadcast dubs that I can't talk about, so I'm having to be really careful with my voice. Uh, uh, and normally I would do the the speech for you, but you know I'll do the speech. I'll just do it at half energy. I can't scream it. <clears throat> I am a soldier, and I have dedicated my heart to the restoration of humanity, sir. 
Nothing can make me prouder than dying for such a noble cause. If we use his Titan ability with the manpower we have left, I believe we can do it. We can retake this city for humanity's glory. And what little time I have left to live, I will advocate his strategic value. That's hot. <laughs> Man, it's hot water. All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, can you do Kotetsu's voice? Oh my God, Kotetsu from uh, Kamisama Kiss. Yes. Climb a tiny god. <laughs> oh my God, that little dude. It looks like he has supposed to be like a half pickle, half mask, or whatever. Like he's got that like weird, that bizarre, like I don't know what he's supposed to be. And at one point he takes the mask off and he has no face. <laughs> uh, yeah, that dude's crazy. Yes. Tokyo Ghoul, what's up, man? Um, so I was wondering. You said you, um, you have Pokemon bones in your body. I do have Pokemon bones in my body. They're eevees. Ah. <laughs> I was wondering, um, are you going to get the Sun and Moon when it comes out? Say it again. Are you going to get Sun and Moon when it comes out? I've been thinking about it. I haven't really played, like, I played a lot of XY, uh, and I was, I was really getting hardcore into, like, raising a team, and I had, like, some perfect IV EVs, like, all EV Lucians for my team, and my freaking Flareon could punch people like nobody's business, man. Like, it's because I would, I would poison him. <laughs> Look at it. He would, he had, he had the charm, he'd be poisoned at the start of the match, and then I would do facade, and it just wrecks people, like erases anything it hits. It was awesome, but uh, I haven't really played much at all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a PC gamer, and so I've been doing a whole lot of Overwatch lately, and, uh, and uh, Legion, since Legion came out. But, uh, oh, Legion is so good. Shaman, they finally got shamans right, dude. Finally got shamans right. Especially, enhancement specifically, they finally got that right. Any other gamers in here? I'm assuming, awesome. Anybody else playing Overwatch? Sweet, okay, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta say fate. Okay, if you could pick, yeah, it's amazing. If you could pick just one out of the 22 to be a main main, which one would you pick? And like, out of the people that have been playing. Feel free, take your time. I'm actually gonna take my time too. It's kind of a toss up though, because I really love Junkrat and I'm good at Junkrat, but I'm also a pretty good Mercy. And Mercy tends to, like, support characters tend to be my jam. So I'd probably have to go with Mercy, it's just a main main. Yes? Diva? Diva? Nerf this. Anybody else? I'm gonna say May. It's, I currently haven't even split between Diva and May, so gotcha. it's like, like exact times for both of those. Same with me, Jump Ride and Mercy, like 25 hours each, something like that. Yeah. May, dude. I like May a lot. I haven't really gotten everything down with her, but watching Seagull play her. <sighs> that dude's ridiculous. Uh, yes. Anna. Anna, you like Anna? Dude, her healing is ridiculous if you can hit them every time. Yeah. And like, I like her utility. She has a hell of a lot of utility. You zoom in, all you have to do is get them in the triangle. Yep. That's it. You're good to go. New triangle. Yep. Oh, I love that game so freaking much. Anybody else like super stoked for Sombra? Oh. Dude, like, who's, is the only one keeping track of the ARG stuff they've been doing? Like all the hidden stuff? It's actually been really good as far as like, like a Secret World way back when did a long ARG campaign that lasted like two years uh, before the game was ever even announced and uh, I remember following that and it was really fun, like, like a lot of stuff went into that ARG and other people have tried stuff like that since then. I feel like Blizzard's the first group that's ever actually done a, a pretty decent job. Yeah, it'd be awesome to be playing Sombra right now, you know, since they gave Ana such a quick release, but I feel like the, the ARG's kind of been worth it so far. Very, pretty, pretty interactive, I feel. Did you have another question, sir? Yeah. No? All right, cool. That's fine. Yes? Can you do the Wanze voice? Oh my god. Oh, I forgot about it. Anybody else seen Wanze, uh, One Piece, you know, Wanze from One Place? Know that? I'm Wanze! It's a mad, mad, mad world, and I'm a mad, mad Wanze! <laughs> If you want to get past me, you'll have to defeat my ramen kenpo! <laughs> Ridiculous, dude. That guy's insane. Uh, 
feel like Robin Williams up here. I want to need the energy. Just start doing voices. Uh, I'll go crazy if y'all let me. Yes, sir, in the back. I've played Horde for the most part for several years, uh, but for Legion, I win Alliance. Yeah, I win Alliance. Uh, the Draenei, and like the Alliance story is really building up. I'm, I really, I'm just sick of losing war chiefs. <laughs> like Thrall, Thrall is war chief. Done. Vol'jin made a good war chief. Vol'jin was a good war chief. I'm not sure about Sylvanas yet. Not sure. We'll we'll just have to see. Uh, yes. Um, uh, what was it like playing? What, what would you say was your favorite part of playing Lithuania in Italia? Lithuania. Come to my country. But don't tell Russia. He'll put me in the closet again. Uh, <laughs> Lithuania, uh, I think my favorite, my absolute favorite Lithuania moment recording Lithuania was for, I think it was the third season. Uh, whichever season he and Poland really started, you know, hitting it off and they had that whole backstory with them. There's this one episode, there's the, uh, the one episode where he's overheard that Russia is planning to invade Poland and he's trying to warn him about it. And uh, Jamie Markey, who plays the narrator for it, she's also been one of the writers for that show since the beginning, she was directing that season. And uh, when we were recording this one particular moment where he calls up Poland to tell him to, you know, be careful, uh, she had a very specific read for it in mind, and the way she told me uh, was, okay, you know, my mother, whenever, whenever she's going to tell me something, like even the like the worst news possible, it always starts off with with like like it's it, it's the simplest thing in the world. Like there's nothing wrong. Like she'll be like, oh hey, like do you remember so and so from down the street? You, you, you used to babysit for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know he worked at the pool. He's dead. <laughs> so essentially that what informed the read for his like you know aunt Poland answers the phone. He's like, you know hey what's up? Like why are you calling me so early in the morning? And it's like. Oh, you know, it's nothing big, it's no big, no, no problem, nothing scary at all. Russia's coming to get you! <laughs> wow. He's funny. I love Lithuania. And he's also the only character that I've ever, like, if I, I, that I had an outtake for that made it onto an outtake reel. I cannot repeat the outtake here, because it's an all-ages panel. And I have the mouth of a sailor when I record, so... You will just skip that one. Yes, ma'am. Out of all the characters I've voiced, who's had the most impact? That's kind of hard to pick. Uh, I actually have five that I consider to be my milestone characters. Uh, <clears throat> the, the first one, is, but that's not the question you asked. Impact-wise. Well, actually, no, but they, they kind of did have impacts on me. Like, there's, there's three of them uh, that I'll say that actually had a major impact on me as a person and kind of in my life. And the uh, first one was Kenichi, the Kenichi and my disciple. Uh, partly because it was my first show for Funimation ever, and I got to be the lead in the show, and it was kind of the fanboy dream come true because all of my masters were people I'd grown up listening to in Dragon Ball. And, and all sorts of other shows, and it was just, it was really cool. But I also really loved the fact that, like, Kenichi just really inspired me as a character just because it, it was so refreshing to, you know, go on a journey with a character that doesn't immediately get power or isn't already immediately super strong. Like, he is, he's a weakling, he has no confidence in himself, he has no muscles on his body, he has no training. But he wants to be a good fighter, he wants to be able to protect himself as well as the people he loves, mostly the people he loves. And he wants to be able to have that confidence in himself. And it was just, it was really cool to go on that journey with him. And it inspired me in a lot of ways to try and better myself uh, and try to get the confidence for myself. And that's still a battle I'm fighting. Uh, st still, that's still, that's a long, hard road. Uh, the second one would be Kurinosuke from Princess Jellyfish. Uh, mostly because, like, A, as a fan, uh, I was getting really kind of burnt out because for a, l a long time, the industry was, uh, the anime industry, uh, well, the, the side of the industry in Japan, where, there had, when they, where they were doing the animation, had really kind of fallen on some hard times because uh, not only there was the huge earthquake and the tsunami that hit and really kind of set some stuff back for them, and there was also the fact that there was rampant piracy going on of all of their stuff. Uh, nobody was buying anything, they were just all streaming it or down bit torrenting it, and a lot of companies were starting to fold. And so the ones that kind of survived that, they weren't willing to make, to take a chance on anything new or anything refreshing. They would only make shows 
uh, based on stuff that had sold in the past, and unfortunately, a lot of that was just nothing but fan service. Like, the only thing that, because sex sells, I guess. And, uh, I mean, sparkly boobies that just bounce around all the time and defy gravity, like, I guess those are funny and entertaining for a joke or for a moment. This does not make a show to me. Like, that, it needs something more than that. And so it was so refreshing when Princess Jellyfish came out because here was this great little slice of life show. No fan service, no magic or ridiculous mayhem, just real people and a story about kind of a lot uh, about a uh, story about a lot of people that again no real confidence in themselves they have their loves and they have their fandoms and that's been and, and but they feel like those things have made them outcasts and to have the main character that not only helps them to come out of that be somebody that could be considered a, that is a cross-dresser or that could be considered transgender uh, or gender fluid to have that type of character portrayed not only in a positive light, but to have that person be the role model of the story was really cool and important to me. Uh, for a long time, I, I felt like, uh, actually for a while, I had considered going through gender reassignment myself and had questioned my own gender identity for a long time. And it was really cool to not only be able to experience that through Kurinosuke, but to kind of be inspired by him and to be like, you know what, he embraces this part of himself, I'm going to embrace that part of myself. I'm going to see if this is something that is really, if it's in, as important to me as I feel it might be. Uh, and that was... And that was really cool. And last would be Armin. Uh, mostly him for the first nine episodes of Titan, because when we first meet him, again, kind of like Kenichi, he 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 was his own worst enemy. He it, saw himself as being pathetic and weak and not strong. That he was not a good friend, and that the his friend that Mikasa and Aaron that he was just a burden to them, that they, he, he wasn't really their friend, and that they saw him as this thing, but he, he was just imposing that on himself. And an episode, I, I think, I'm pretty sure it was nine, where he does the speech, the moments just before the speech were so important for that character, because that's the moment when Aaron tells him, no, look, dude, we trust you. Like, you keep a level head. You are the one who, like, you're, you have this great mind, and whatever you would decide, if you think it's the best course of action, we will follow it bar none. We, we trust you with our lives. And it was just such a great moment for him to realize, oh, crap, they don't think this about me. I think this about me, and only me. And for him to be able to, to see that and have that moment of, of, of personal clarity where, and it was really cool, there's a, there's a visual poetry that they do in that scene where uh, the Titan body, the, like the half Titan body that's behind him, as all of these horrible self thoughts and the self image of himself fall away, the Titan corpse deteriorates and falls away behind him as well. And it was just this beautiful poetic imagery uh, that, ugh, that that's my favorite moment in the entire show for him. Like the speech was the icing on the cake as far as I'm concerned and it was really inspiring. Uh, it, it kind of helped me remember that a lot of times we tend to all be our own worst enemy with the things we think about ourselves and, and kind of assume that everybody else sees these bad things about us as well when generally they don't and that's Again, it's a hard thing to be able to get past and to work past, but I think it's important and it's essential. So, that was my answer. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good question. Uh, another one. Uh, you uh, have not asked one, sir. And then I'll and then I'll get. To, did you have your hand up? All right. I'll get back to you in just a second. Yeah, please. What you were just saying. Um, yeah, Attack on Titan is really good with that kind of visual poetry. Like in the beginning, it's definitely not very Armin centric. But as as the second episode came along with the second opening, yeah, there's a part where Armin's getting like showered with like human blood, right? Yeah. And he's thinking about solutions. And right as like his eyes open up, like all the candles in a background fade away to one. So it's like centering around the fact that he's got an idea. Yeah. This is genius. Yeah, I didn't realize that. That's a great point. That's really freaking cool. And then, then there's a whole other thing too about like just the walls in general. You can almost view the walls as being uh, the things that we impose on ourselves that hold us back. Uh, like, and, and the fact that the scouts are considered to be the brave, the, the bravest among the brave, and also a little crazy, is because they're the only ones that are willing 
to go outside of that, to go outside of their comfort zone, to go outside and, and face the things that they fear. Uh, it, again, just, again, there's so many life lessons embedded into that show that it's, I cannot wait for the second thing. I'm, need it now, we needed it two years ago. So, like, and, uh, yes, back to you, sir. Um, and then we'll get uh, back to you as well. What is both your favorite role you ever, you've ever done and your least favorite role? Okay. Favorite role ever. Again, that's like asking me to pick a favorite child, which... Do once I have children, I guess I'll see if I can actually pick a favorite. <laughs> like, this one's a jerk. <laughs> uh, um, let's see. I would probably say Kurenosuke, just for not only just how I, important I think I felt that that show was for a bunch of different people, but just kind of how important it was for me. Uh, and it was challenging too, like being able to pull off the Kura voice and you know keep that fabulous thing going, darling, uh, at all times. It was like that. it was work. In fact, one of my my favorite story that has to do with finding that voice was uh, Christopher Bevins, who directed the show. Uh, before he cast it, he actually uh, he sent out a call to all the males that he knew at the studio that could feasibly do a, a passable female voice, uh, and. Uh, and uh, he, well, I was one of the first, I was at the first person to audition for the show, and I got Kurenosuke. Uh, and as soon as the auditions were over, he said, okay, this part is yours, I have homework for you. There's a very specific type of personality that he, that, that, a voice that I want him to portray whenever he's in Kura mode. And uh, he told me to go and watch the first season of Sex in the City, and to focus specifically on the character Samantha. And I did, and I got it. I knew exactly what he was looking for, but there was something about Samantha that was missing, and I, that I felt in personality in relation to Cora, and that's the fact that she's not a fashionista. Uh, she, there's nothing that has to do with 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 uh, with fashion or looks or anything like that. She's she's very much the she is kind of a hell's on wheels female, and she is she's a very strong willed female, and that's kind of that's the that's what Cora brings. But there wasn't just that little thing. So in order to bring the voice, I combined Samantha from Sex and the City with Rarity from My Little Pony, Friends of His Magic, and that's how Kuro was born. That's great, darling! You look fabulous, really. Put makeup on, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, back to you, sir. I wish I could go, but I'm having a freaking tether heater. I'm um, should I come up, or...? If you don't mind, then... No, no, it's just gonna... How hard does this actually go? Alright, this is how far it goes. Got this, man. Don't impale me. Yeah, this is... I've hit a few people for that. Yeah, I don't doubt it, man. It looks great. Yeah, so, so, what was your question? So, I met Lauren Landa... Okay. ...three years ago at this convention. Okay. And she mentioned um, something about you, like, you know, Armin and his relationship, I was just curious, because I write for them sometimes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, like, I, I ship them. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of the closest, that's the quickest answer to that. Uh, I felt like there really was, it, especially further into the series, when, you know, Annie actually, you know, says, you're a, you're a good person. Like, almost as if to say, you're the only decent human being I've ever met. <laughs> And, uh, like, because he's honest, he doesn't put on a facade, he is always genuine, he is himself at all times, and he is, he, he's got a big heart, and, uh, I felt that especially that the moment of the big reveal for her at the end when, you know, she says, I wish I could have been a good per I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I could play this part for you, Armin, the, the, being a good person for you. But, and you know, then she kind of sheds that off. It made me really feel like there was a part of, of Anne that uh, she is keeping held back. Like, she wants to be able to trust someone. She wants to be able to be a good person. But her entire upbringing and her situations have forced her to be distrustful of everyone and to only think of herself. And I felt like, especially after she's frozen in that whole thing, I was like, okay, Armin needs to figure out a way to get her out of there, Sleeping Beauty style, and have like a straight up, like, it'd be, it would be great. They'd... Romance, Titan romance. <laughs> yes. 
Um, I forget the exact line, uh -huh. but there's a line where um, he comes out from the underground and yells something at her like, it's either this is your last gamble. Yeah, or, yeah, this is, yeah, this is my wager. Yeah, it's like, you've been having your gamble, here's my wager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, just artistically brilliant in every way they animated that. Yes, sir. I'm still curious in the second half of the question as to what your least favorite role is. Oh my god, I'm sorry, I completely forgot that. Uh, least favorite role, Yuki from Future Diary. Yes. <laughs> oh my god, grow up hair. Yuki, grow up frickin' hair. Uh, and, and a lot of that also, like, the reason why I don't like that character in that show it didn't, it doesn't even really have to do with the show as much as it did with the, a lot of the technical issues we have while recording it. Uh, the, the files that we had gotten from Japan were corrupted, so the video files worked fine, but whenever we would go to record and replace audio, the music and the sound effects would drop. So, like, I would record in a literal vacuum. There was no music to play off of or to get, like, a feel for what the scene was, like, what the intensity of the scene was. Uh, and a lot of times, I was one of the first people to record, so there were no other actors for me to play off of. I, like, literally was just, like, I had to find every single line with, with nobody else to play off of, with no, no music to follow, no cues. I just had the script and what the director, like, thankfully, Zach Bolton knew what he wanted it to sound like, what the whole picture was. But because I really couldn't add to that, I essentially had to be a puppet for 24 episodes and uh, didn't really feel creatively challenged or, or anything like that. It just kind of felt like a labor and labor of love at that point. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my least favorite. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just came in, so I don't know if you, um, if you answered this before, but what's the most emotional scene that you've had to record? Ooh, emotional. Probably the episode directly after an, an, an attack on Titan. Uh, the the scene, the the episode directly after Aaron uh, becoming an entree. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Armin, uh, that whole episode where he's just he's he's practically catatonic. He's just crying the whole time, and he's seeing all these horrible things. And especially when he comes across the, the two lovers, and like, bless her heart, and she's just trying to bring this corpse back to life. And just, you see that moment of him just, just, just completely breaking down. Like, it, it, it's him witnessing the horrors of war right after he's just seen his best friend and one of the last real family that he has left in the world, you know, dying. And it's his fault. In a lot of ways, it's his fault. And it's, like, that was really freaking hard. As an actor, it's one of the hardest things, one of the, one of the biggest challenges I've had over the years is being able to cry, like to bring myself to that emotional place during performance because I'm generally a really happy person. I like to keep myself in a, in a positive, I bring a lot of energy to everything I do, or at least I try to. And uh, that, was, uh, that was really, really challenging for me, but Mike McFarland is a great director and he helped me to get to that place. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, is anybody raising their hand over here? I'm, I keep looking this way and I... Okay, we're cool. Yes? Um, what is... Okay, what is a manga or anime that you um, have really loved one version of it, but you absolutely hate the other version? Like, like love the sub, hate the dub, and vice versa? Or something like that? Or is that what you're asking? Okay, so like, do I like the manga version better than the anime version, or vice versa? I've never really been much of a manga reader, honestly. Uh, there's a few that I have that I've collected, mostly, like, really the only ones that I, that I have even a sizable collection of, and by sizable, I mean three. <laughs> like, it is Slayers, because Slayers is my all-time favorite anime, always will be. Uh, if you've never seen it, highly recommend it. It's a staple series, it's so good. Um, and a lot of the Pokemon people got their start on that show. Uh, but, uh, hmm. do I? I do have a lot of fairy tale. I have, actually, no, that's the biggest collection I have. I have like 20 of the fairy tale volumes, but that's because I wrote the show for the dub. And uh, it's really close. 
Like, there's really not that much of a difference between the manga and the anime. They damn near do stuff shot for shot sometimes, uh, and stick really close to, to the script for each version. Uh, it's very rarely that they deviate. Uh, I guess there's one thing about Fairy Tale that they added into the anime of characters that never appeared in the manga, and that is the Butt Jiggle Gang. What? They really could have done without those guys. Yeah, granted it gave us a lot of opportunities to make fart jokes, but that only goes so far. Yeah, and I, I feel like, you know, yeah, we maybe could have done without that. You can take the butts out, okay? Butts out. Uh, another question? Yes? Um, yeah, um, okay. So this one's more related to, I guess, industry and your personal um, So, I for one deal with a lot of uh, social anxiety issues and everything like that. Right there with you. And, uh, so, I was curious whether or not, um, like, what's it like to be a voice actor working with um, your directors and everything like that, especially in your, like, instance, I have some voice actors. Um, to work that closely with people on such a regular basis, you know, and then have to deal with that on top of it, do they just kind of become your family after a while? Or? Uh, there are some there are some people that I've, uh, I've become really close with and I would like to think that I'm really good friends with But there's always been that underlying and a lot of it has to do with my social anxiety is I, I tend to kind of go to the worst possible scenario in my head and Like I, I, I like people I like being able to hang out with people especially like-minded and uh, I, I never had that growing up in a little Country town that I grew up in where it was if you didn't play football or go to church something's wrong with you I, I hear you, dude. It's, it's, it can be rough. Uh, and, like, I, I never really had like-minded people around, and so having that for the first time in my life, having them also be essentially co-workers and, to some extent, uh, rivals, like, people, I mean, I'm competing against these people as well for, for roles and stuff, it, 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 it's, it, it can be really weird to want to be friends with everybody and to really want to try to be close with people and, and just really enjoy the fact that we're making something so fun and cool for a living but also feel like well if i if like it, it, there's constantly this like this fear in the back of your head of like are, are they are they thinking that i'm just trying to like win them over or am i trying to like mooch roles or whatever so like i tend to not actually talk to people i don't go and hang out with a lot of them and uh, that's a lot of it just has to do with my anxiety if i don't want to appear as being this type of person i just want to be friends and stuff but it's uh Again, another challenge, another thing to work over. Uh, working with new directors for a long time was very, very hard for me. Uh, I, I would constantly be, because each director has their own little way of doing things, and I would get used to one director for a long time, and then I'd come with a new director, and they would do something completely different, and it would throw me off. I would feel very, like, I would feel uncomfortable, and my confidence would go out the window, and I would feel like everything I was doing just sucked, and I shouldn't even be doing this anymore. Well, who do I think I am? Like, I'm not an actor. And to have to work through that eventually, I got to the point where, you know, I had to tell myself, you know, if they're keeping what I'm recording, they like it. And at the end of the day, that's all I'm here to do, is to give the director what they want and move on. And, like, finally, you know, when I got that mantra stuck in my head, uh, it became really easy. Now I, I work with new people all the time, and it's, and it's, it's a breeze. It, it, you you, you kind of get used to it, I feel. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, over your career, how have you um, expanded and broadened your voicing range and okay. decided what you were going to use for each character? You guys have a little bit when you said the director right. sometimes will ask you, but in the beginning, you have to, I guess. Uh, I kind of had a, a pretty good range before I started into it, mostly because I, I grew up just imitating anything and everything that I heard on TV, especially cartoon characters and favorite movies. Because I just I'm, a, I'm an audio learner. Like that's that I, I focus on reads and I listen very intently into how people talk. Uh, and I would try to imitate a lot of stuff. And before getting into it, I thought, oh, voice work. I need to be able to do a lot of silly, crazy stuff. And so. I would have voices like this ready in the background for like some sort of really cool creature. Or 
I could be a little midget for you if you'd like me to. And, or we could, uh, like just all sorts of just ridiculous things. I, I'd go for to the absolute lowest I can go, or to the deepest parts of my voice, or I can go to the very highest that I can, or play a little bit girl if I could. And, uh, like, just try to get my range as vast and different as I could. And in the end, you get to the anime, and they're like, okay, we want you to sound like you. <laughs> what? <laughs> Me? This, my voice isn't interesting. But apparently what they say is, you know, a lot of t you, you'll never feel like your voice is unique, but it is, and that's what they're looking for. Uh, is that 10? 10? Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, that's what they're looking for most of the time, and, 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 a lot, and especially because so much of anime in the last few years, there's rarely anything that's super over the top. Like, we all think of like Dragon Ball Z and stuff, and we think voice work. You have these larger than life characters, and you, like, you'll have Majin Buu. <laughs> and all these, you know, high-pitched voices, and little Bobbity, <laughs> imagine me. Uh, That's my horrible Bobbity impression. <laughs> or they, you'll feel like, oh, I want to be able to do good and sweet, yes. The little fat pool is nice and cool, so juicy, sweet. Um, and just, you feel like you'd be able to do that stuff, but no, like, so much of anime is very slice of life, or is, is, is closer to reality when it comes to performance. Even when you have a world filled with magic and mayhem, or anything like that, the characters are still portrayed as very real. Yeah, they can get big and loud and kooky, but they're not like crazy voices. So generally, most of the roles I've ever done in the last 12 years have been either my voice, kind of like this, a little bit higher, or a little bit lower. And that's pretty much the range I stick in most of the time. Like, uh, very rarely do I get to really play around and do some crazy kooky stuff. I think the last time that I did uh, was Fent and Blood Blockade Battlefront. Have anybody seen that? Cool, it's got some of it. All right, cool. Yeah, I essentially just did my Mark Hamill Joker for that and uh, just had a blast with him. Uh, what was one of his lines? I'm trying to think of that because he has this huge monologue at the start. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, hello, it's been a while. It's me, Femmes, the king of the property! <laughs> uh, I decided to make my own fun. This is your fault. Uh, and stuff like that, just really getting to, like, he had so much energy and he was just a freaking roller coaster and that was a blast. I really got to play around with him. Uh, that's my answer. Well, you done a great job. Thank you very much. Uh, who has, you have not asked a question yet. Uh, so, what was the hardest voice it was hard for you to perform? The hardest voice? The hardest voice for you to perform. I had, I'll do it for all of two seconds, because it is really hard. Um, I had this villain that I played for one hour uh, for ADB Films back in the day. Uh, it was just a little bit part in a show called 009-1 that uh, it's kind of an extension of the 009 Cyborg series. Uh, and it uh, takes place in kind of a not so historically accurate version of the Cold War. Like, what if the Cold War between the United States and Russia kept going forever? Uh, just so basically a big spy drama. And I have this one villain that works for the Western Bloc, uh, the Eastern Bloc, that captures one of the main spies. And everything he did sounded like this. I'm constantly just rushing air over my vocal cords and drying out. I had to take like, I, I went through like six of these in 20 minutes. Wow. Voicing that character and yeah, that's <laughs> not bad. Thankfully he only talked for an hour. T is your friend in the voice acting world. Uh, yes, ma'am, you've got this question. And then we'll get to, to you and then to you. So, did you say you started directing? I did uh, a little bit last season. I did some assistant directing uh, for uh, Dragon R Academy and for a little bit of Free, uh, the first season of Free. And uh, there was one more. And uh, Data Live. I, I ended up directing pretty much most of Data Live season two. I did not with Sarah for the end, but uh, thank you. Uh, but during the uh, 
Uh, that was during the time that we were we were kind of just starting a lot of the broadcast dubbing. Who here does not know what the broadcast dubs are for Funimation? Cool, that's awesome. All right, I will tell you in a second. Uh, <laughs> um, we were doing simul dubs, so at the same time that Jerry Jewell, who was my lead director and I was assistant director, was recording Sarah for the end for the simul dubs, uh, a DVD show we were recording was, I believe at the time, Dragon R. It was either Dragon R or Doing Alive. And uh, so I was focusing my efforts primarily on that and recording in the evening from 6 to 10. And from 10 to 6 uh, every day, he was recording Seraph at the end. So only once or twice did I ever, like at night, he might have like some bit parts that were coming in, some people that were coming in to play some little bit parts, and I would record them on Seraph. I, I think, actually, yeah, I can tell you exactly what it was. I recorded Aaron Dismuke for two lines. <laughs> On Seraph at the end, he was doing some background stuff. They were students evacuating the school in like episode two or whatever, and all he says is like, dude, what's going on? And that was it. And, and it was like, great job, we're done. That's a wrap. And, and that was pretty much it. Uh, you, sir? And then and then over to you. What was your question? Yeah, uh, your... Um, what would, uh... What two shows would you think would uh, mix together or come together? Would you like to see? Two shows? If I could take two shows and mix them together, what would they be? Hmm. Dude, that's really interesting. You just gave me way, way too many options to choose from here. Do they have to both be anime? Uh, no, I didn't. No? All right. Ooh, that's even worse. <laughs> Star Wars. And meets Princess Jellyfish. <laughs> I'm a fabulous Jedi. Come join the light side. We have fabulousness. Uh, let's see. Uh, that could be one. Or Star Trek and Slayers. Or Friends and Attack on Titan. <laughs> would just die early and we wouldn't have to deal with his BS. You, sir. If there is... Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The, the, okay. the gentleman behind you, and if we have time, then I'll answer your question. We have, like, three minutes left. It's a quick one. I can count. Yes, sir. Uh, what is your favorite line that you've recorded for an anime? Favorite line for an anime? Another hard one. Let's see. <laughs> I think it would be... Probably, uh, has anyone ever seen The Wallflower? Someone, okay, a few people. Uh, I play the character named uh, Kyohei Takano in that he's kind of, uh, he's the, one, of the, one of four super pretty boys that go to uh, this particular high school and all the girls like fawn over him or whatever. And there's this one episode where he is, uh, he's running a takoyaki or octopus ball stand, uh, making octopus balls for his school festival because he wants to raise money to pay rent. And, uh, where every girl in school is lined up at his booth or whatever, and these four, these four like bully jocks or whatever come up and just like, what? These octopus balls look like crap, bro. Yeah, I wouldn't feed it to my dog. And uh, so Kyohei, just being the cool cucumber he is, is like, sorry, fellas, if you want to try my balls, you got to get in line behind the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> We got one minute. Is it a quick one? It is not a quick one. All right. Uh, uh, you have a quick one? Sorry, man. So have you heard of Steve Bloom? And if you haven't, um, I do. Oh yeah. Steve so have I you worked with him? So yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. I said that's the answer to my question. Would you like uh, to work with him? All right. Cool. There we go. <laughs> cool. The guys, thank you so much. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all your questions. Uh, I'm doing an autograph. Uh, you know, Six thirty. 6.30 to 7.30 over in the autographs. I'd, I'd love to be able to see you there, and I'll also be here tomorrow. If, uh, if I don't get to see you, please be safe and enjoy the rest of the car.